Hello, everybody. Can y'all hear me? Can y'all hear me all right? Cool, cool. Yeah, talk a little louder. Just a little louder. All right. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. All right. I'm going to yell a little bit, so apologies. Yeah. Um, thanks, everybody, for uh, welcoming us into the space and... Uh, this has just been a really amazing experience so far. It's been um, really cool to connect with everybody. And so today, um, I'm really excited about this conversation. Uh, my name is William C. Anderson, and I'm up here with the amazing, legendary uh, hero, Modibo Kadali. I'm saying all this because I know he's going to get really uncomfortable and upset with me for saying it. <laughs> and he does. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So I just want to put as much um, uncomfortable emphasis on him as possible just because he's going to probably uh, have words for me when I get back to Georgia. Um, and also I'm joined uh, by Janina Urban and Lorenzo Camboa Urban. All of these people are um, phenomenal thinkers, uh, writers, uh, revolutionaries, uh, and elders who have had tremendous experiences that have um, brought us together to have this conversation about the legacies of black anarchism and the complexities and the dynamics that I think we all draw from uh, today to be able to have lessons and inspiration about where these politics can um, take us and um, uh, the different things that they can lend to our, our various movements. So I'm really excited to have this conversation. And if y'all do not mind, I'm going to be looking at my phone while we have this conversation because that's where the questions are at. I'm not on Instagram. I just want to make, make, make y'all aware that I'm not, I'm not on social media. I'm just actually um, looking at questions. So ooh, just want to... All right, cool. So just want to get started. And um, I also want to say, too, that we, we do want this to be a, uh, a open dialogue and for folks to really be engaged with the conversation. So um, don't feel too rigid or too uh, disconnected from the conversation. We want everybody to be involved. So you know, if you want to just kind of jump in or you know, raise your hand or however, whatever makes you feel comfortable as a, as a way to kind of join in, this con join in this conversation at various points, I think that um, that'll be okay. And if it's, if it's cool with, with y'all and as well, all right? So to get started, I wanna ask the, f the first question I had is, um, the arrival or turn away from traditional status and nationalist politics is symboled by the embrace of black anarchism among the black power era and the civil rights era radicals who made that, who made that turn away. So can, can you all tell us, if you could start with Lorenzo, can you tell us um, more about what was going on at the time that led to such a turn and such a pivot away from those traditional status, um, kind of top-down hierarchical um, and more authoritarian understandings of politics that contributed to this wave of black anarchism and black autonomous uh, well, <clears throat> politics. And so if we can start with Lorenzo and work our way to Janina and Madibo, can just comment on that? Um, for me, that um, was a brief period, for a brief period I was in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee after I came out of the Army. and. Uh, I was also working with SNCC as a, I was coming out of the Army and opposed to the Vietnam War and all that, um, was selling the Black Panther newspaper at one stage. And um, so I saw SNCC, uh, which some people, some people like referred to almost as a uh, anarchist organization, but they referred to it in white terms, you know, like the, what, whatever the the Europeans' uh, conception of anarchism was, this is what they tried to apply to SNCC. 
Uh, for me, I've always said that um, an autonomous movement is based actually on the material conditions and the political conditions of the, the you know, whatever uh, people created. Black people created, for instance, uh, uh, what we are talking about is black anarchism. Um, black autonomy uh, was actually based on a, a theory as opposed to some people try to claim that it was based on the ideas of European leftism or something that they call themselves autonomous. <clears throat> no. Um, what went into it were movements that we saw in the 1960s. That's why I called my first book Anarchism and the Black Revolution because I was talking about a revolution was taking place, a black revolution was taking place this, at this time and yet the anarchist movement was not addressing itself to it and in point of fact has never really addressed itself to the black struggle. And so um, that is what opened the door uh, for even discussions about race in the so-called anarchist movement in North America um, that I became a part of and constantly had to struggle in almost as a solitary and singular individual for some years. That's why I started writing and talking and, and challenging the ideas that were there. Uh, to make them move over and realize that a new movement was coming on the scene. Uh, I don't know if that gives you what you want. Okay. Well, you know, the, 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 the black power movement, um, as Renzo said, it was autonomous, but you have to understand it as a, you have to understand, okay, you have to understand the black power movement as being a response to, you know, white supremacy in America. And black people felt like, you know, we have to, uh, you know, run our own movement. We have, to we have to have autonomy over our own struggle uh, because it's, it's our struggle, it's primarily affecting us, and it's important, uh, you know, that, that we be in control. About 11, 12 years ago, I guess now, I wrote a book called Driven by the Movement, Activist of the Black Power Era. And I interviewed people who were, not, who were not household names. There may have been one or two who were fairly famous, but you did not see them on the six o'clock news or anything like that. These are people, grassroots people, black people in their communities organizing, whether it was around uh, you know, trying to get food for, uh, you know, get people decent prices at the grocery store, whatever it was, they were organizing on a local level, everyday people. And with black power, it actually, there, you know, maybe historians and p p political scientists who use their terminology, I'm not a political scientist, I'm not a historian, you know, I'm just a revolutionary elder trying to describe this the best way I can. But um, <laughs> the black power movement fundamentally changed race relations in the United States because you had black people saying, we're in charge now of our own movement. And, um, and uh, there's no going back from that. We're in charge, we're running this now. And uh, you know, white people need to respect that, our, our autonomy. And of course, we have not always gotten that respect. We still, still don't get that respect. We can talk about that later on. But at any rate, it changed it fundamentally changed race relations in the United States, uh, which is why, you know, you know, the FBI counterintelligence program and other police agencies, the CIA, whatever, uh, destroyed it, went after it, deliberately went after it to destroy it. And of course, at that time, the Black Power Movement was already in existence, so they were trying to destroy a movement already alive. Today, what you have a situation where they don't ever want to see a black power movement come up again. That's why they destroyed the one from back then. So now they're trying to destroy any kind of a movement that develops uh, before it can get off the ground. So that's why you see so many movements and things, including uh, Black Lives Matter, which has done some good work, and I give respect to that. But uh, you know, they have largely, to a great degree, they have been co-opted. Uh, you know, nonprofits have come in to take over and try to mute the voice of the people. So, you know, in a nutshell, uh, 
that is how I would respond to that question. Modibo, go ahead and uh, tell us tell us your response as well, please. Yeah, mine is, mine is uh, personal like that, but I, I observed the same thing that was going on is that black people were trying to organize themselves and get things done addressing their own needs. And uh, they were activists uh, trying to throttle it. So let me tell you my situation. I was at Langston University teaching and there was an authoritarian president of a school out there that was really just taking advantage of everything he could. But anyway, I got, you know, I got canned from out there, but I, I was coming to Detroit anyway, because Detroit was where the drum strike took place. Uh, I had uh, known some people in Detroit and I had been an underground um, uh, draft dodger in Canada since 1965. And I would sneak in to Detroit I snuck in the first time in 66, uh, and then I snuck in again, and, uh, and I stuck, snuck in again by, by going out to Oklahoma in 67. But anyway, uh, the Dodd Main Strike took place, and I got a job at Highland Park College teaching uh, developmental studies, which was right down the uh, street from the main office of, of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. So I joined the League, and uh, I began to see that there were people who really were not understanding, in my estimation, what the masses themselves were doing. And uh, so I began to study organiz radical organization. And during this particular time, there was a lot of fervor in Detroit. There was the CP, there was the SWP, there was the PP, there was all kind of Marxist, Leninist, this and that, and this and that. And one of the organizations was led by CLR James. Uh, he would say it was not led by him, but he was a part of it. And uh, it was called Facing Reality. And they had a bookstore up on Woodward Avenue. And so me and my friend Jalali Farrakhan, he's Otis, you know, he still lives in Canada. Yeah, and he, he came back and he decided he was gonna stay in Canada. But anyway, we used to raid the bookstores, but they would let us uh, read what they wanted to read. Often times, they would they, these radical organizations would put out their propaganda because they knew we were coming. <laughs> so we we thought we were stealing it, but they were really putting it out there for us. So uh, one of the bookstores on the list was the Fate Reality Bookstore on Woodward Avenue, and the uh, white radical up there was Willie Gorman. Uh, you know, kind of a you know, radical at the time, labor, labor union guy, Stuart, and uh, went up there and, 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 and he asked us, he said, what, what are y'all reading? I said, well, we were at the league and we wanted to read some, uh, some kind of way to organize, to help us organize. And of course we were black, black, black then. And so uh, I wanted to know about the dialectic from a philosophical point of view. So CLR had just written a book called Notes on the Dialect. So he gave us that. And uh, he slipped in and he saw that we were black, 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 and he wanted to understand how that related. So we tried our best to explain how, how that related. And uh, basically he led us to CLR James. And when we got back to the league and I told him that I, we were reading CLR and they said, well, he's a black anarchist. So I, I, I didn't know, <laughs> I really didn't know uh, the book, the, the little pamphlet called Every Cook Can Govern. It's about the, um, keep in mind that I'm a young guy, you know, maybe 23, 24 years old. And uh, this little pamphlet he put in there called Every Cook Can Govern. So uh, I tried to read it. It, wasn't, it didn't have any meaning for me then. But as I read it, I began to understand that it was about direct democracy and it was about democracy. And I saw in the league that they were really having no democracy at all. And that uh, whatever the everyday ordinary levels of the society, of, of the organization while well, we're doing all the work, it didn't get up to the leadership and the leadership were going around saying all kinds of different things. And so uh, uh, they made me 
part of the political education. And they also made me, uh, what I, you know, just appointed me. And they made me uh, part of the central central committee. And uh, next thing I know, it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was going to be a Marxist-Leninist party. And so we tried to structure a Marxist-Leninist party, but nobody ever consulted the rank and file people about anything. And so I later got purged. And then I began, I, we work with an organization in, in Highland Park region called PAC. And these people were, 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 were trying to stop the school board from building a school on the top of a expressway. And they were engaged in some real people. And these people did not read Marx, Leninist, none of that. They just came to our office and showed us what they wanted us to do. And we joined them. And I thought we, we, we recall the city council. We, we used to raise hell with the city government. And I really, that was a, a way that I learned that people organize themselves. You know, I, I was just a facilitator of the activities and these people just trying to do the best they can with what they had. We had a guy who was a junkyard dealer, another guy who, another woman who was his sister-in-law, they were organized. I mean, they were just concerned people getting together to address their problems. And I loved them people. Those people were warm and affectionate to me and my partner then. And we started, we developed a steady group and we started uh, having people participate in all manner of activities in the, the city of Detroit. Some of them would come in from the trade union movement. Some of them would come in from the uh, black studies movement. Some of them would come in from the community control movement. And we studied whatever we were, we were studying. Right. And to me, we were very effective for the time we were there. We met every Sunday, just like church. <laughs> right. And uh, I, of course, it's not documented. I'm going to document it, but it's not documented. Then I realized that this is some good stuff we were doing. We were doing more than these other organizations, which were on Front Street at the time. Every time you look around, uh, somebody is saying something, proclaiming themselves to this or the that or the other. And the, the tragedy of it all is that these are the people who are recorded as the makers of history of the time. And uh, they were not. They were not. They're the people who are also the primary sources. They are not. And that's how history gets distorted, by looking at these charismatic leaders, looking at these people. And uh, <laughs> I realized that by 1972-73, the social motion in Detroit was almost at a standstill, yet people were saying, we are organized. So you had the RNA, Republic of New Africa, you had several different iterations of the league. You had, had the Pan-African Congress USA, you had the Black, <laughs> Black Christian Nationalists. You had all these people, but the masses were standing still. They were throttled. Then I realized that uh, part of the problem is these people were not given any breathing room to do what they were doing previously. Okay, I'm so sorry, so, so let me so let me jump in there. So yeah. I I I I love the way that all of y'all responded because um, I knew that you were going to introduce yourselves in some way, shape, or form in the history uh, that brings us to this point. And I think that the interesting thing uh, about about you is you had. Um, different experiences in different places in the country, but they thread together in a way that I, that I find is just uh, really amazing for this conversation, whether it's um, your experience, Lorenzo, as a political prisoner and writing Anarchism and the Black Revolution, and your experience with SNCC, your experience in the civil rights movement, and your experience meeting Martin Sostre and being introduced to anarchism that way. And Janina, your experiences within the party, your, your history in Detroit and in Oakland as the last editor of the Black Panther Party newspaper, um, and uh, the way your, your writing lends itself to this conversation. And Modibo, your experience with the League and with CLR, and you, you're talking about how um, anarchism was projected onto to CLR James. And so all of these, these different experiences that you had led you to a point where you started being critical of coercive hierarchy, of authoritarianism, 
of uh, top-down organizing, of vanguardism, um, charismatic leadership, these things that are still very much thriving in social movements today. But you all have different relationships to the word anarchism. I know especially that uh, you have a different relationship to it particularly as well, uh, Modibo. So I wanna ask you, um, how do you, what is, what is the word anarchism, what does anarchism mean to you? Um, how do you think about it? How do you interpret it? And can we start with Janina? Can you tell me um, just what it means to you and, and what, what it symbolizes, what it means for your politics? Can you just talk about uh, what, what anarchism means for you? Um, well, basically for me, anarchism is autonomy, okay? Independence. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a student of, uh, I haven't studied anarchism like the brothers that I'm sitting here with who've all read all the texts and they know the history of the, the theoretical. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not, a, I'm, not, I'm not what you would call a card-carrying anarchist. I'm not, because I, I never studied anarchism. I'm not trying to put it down, but I've never studied it. it. But what drew me to it was the fact that it is symbolizes autonomy. And in fact, for me, for many years, um, I did not think that anarchism was relevant to me as, as a black woman in America. Uh, when I was in the Black Panther Party, uh, I joined the Black Panther Party here in Detroit, but we later relocated to Oakland, California, which was a national headquarters of the Black Panther Party. And in the Bay Area, which is a very diverse you know, city in terms of you know, cultures and nationalities, I would go to events, but I would never see a person of color who was an anarchist. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that there were no people of color who were, who were not anarchists back then. I'm talking about the early, mid-70s. I'm sure there were, but I never saw them, okay? So that led me to make a conclusion, which you know, may have been false, but I said, well, this must be something that black people, people of color, are not relating to because I don't see any of them. So I made the determination then that uh, anarchism was irrelevant to the black struggle. Now I've changed my mind since then, but that was my initial conclusion because I didn't see any black people. I didn't see any people like me who were anarchists. And to me that meant anarchism was irrelevant to the black struggle. Uh, so uh, and the first time I ever uh, you know, heard of a black anarchist was Lorenzo. And I hadn't quite met him yet, but uh, I was like, hmm, there's a black person who's an anarchist? I never saw one before. But anyway, to, 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 to bring this, to, to, to conclude this, it means autonomy, it means the right of a people, whatever they are, whoever they are, self-determination to decide how they're going to live, how they're gonna wage their struggle, and not be dictated to somebody who's not in their community. Uh, I became an anarchist uh, in prison, uh, on my way to prison. Uh, in September 1969, um, I was uh, on the run from, from the federal government in Eastern Europe, I was in Eastern Europe. I had been to Cuba, and uh, you know I was uh, arrested eventually in uh, in Eastern Europe and brought back to New York City and put into the Federal House of Detention. And there I met Martin Sostry, and Martin Sostry was probably the best known political prisoner in the world at that time. Um, I didn't know who he was though. I had no knowledge of who he was. But uh, when I got into the prison, I was concerned that um, I was facing the death penalty uh, for hijacking a plane to Cuba. And so I wanted to talk to somebody. I couldn't talk to some lawyer or somebody. I didn't trust the government uh, lawyers that they were trying to give me. So um, I went to talk to this jailhouse lawyer, as they called them back in the day. And uh, so I met Martin Sostry. Well, Martin Sostry was a hell of a lot more than a jailhouse lawyer. He was a, uh, a revolutionary black anarchist. He was a, you know, a, a veteran black activist. He was a, a revolutionary scholar, had, had a, a revolutionary bookstore he'd started, black revolutionary bookstore, activist bookstore in Buffalo, New York, and all this stuff. And I learned all this when I met him. I didn't know anything about him. 
and nobody would tell me anything. They were kind of scared of him, they act like. And um, he was a very serious, stern uh, looking individual when I met him. Very serious, very stern. And although I'm not fearful of people or something or other, I had to take a step back and see what, what's up with this brother, you know. And uh, <laughs> he gave me one smile, one smile, and set me at ease, and that was that. He wasn't doing no smiling while he was talking, though. And he educated me on the specifics of anarchist politics, black revolutionary politics, anarchist politics, a synthesis. Uh, he educated me for days. I was in that prison for two years, two days, I'm sorry, two months, two months in this prison. And I was going to trial back and forth. And he knew, he, after he met me and talked for, with me for a while, he was concerned that I could be executed because hijacking a plane uh, was a capital offense. So he was, a, he was concerned about that. And so we came up with a legal strategy. And it worked. And uh, then after that happened, and I knew I wasn't going, going to be executed down south in Georgia, some redneck court, then uh, we started talking more, you know. And we started talking about the specifics of anarchist politics, and he politically educated me. And that's when I became an anarchist. And um, he, of course, was able to get out of prison on the frame-up case that they had him on and, and began to live his life and, and train the youth and so forth. Um, for me, it was a different proposition. I was in prison and had to fight my way out. And for 15 years, I, you know, I was in prison. I had two life sentences. But I was alive. I wasn't executed, which, which could have happened. And that was attributable to him telling me a strategy. I'm not going to tell you what the strategy was. You don't need to know. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, he had taught me a great deal um, of the tenets of anarchism, but also telling me that anarchism was not just for white people. He says that if you look at it in the United States, it's a white movement. And in many countries, it's still a white movement. It's European dominated. It has a you know, Eurocentrist history. But it also is a, in his terminology to me, his explanation, it's a universal theory. It's a liberation theory. He said, it's people in control of their own lives and their own movements without leadership, without a traditional leadership, and without the government being, you know, the objective to just to take power from the government and put it in the hands of some bureaucracy or some uh, authoritarian regime, authoritarian party, I should say. And so I had an understanding, that basic understanding, and, and began to read over the years I was in prison, I'd read for 10 years before I wrote Anarchism and the Black Revolution. I tried to convince many people inside the prisons and outside the prison uh, about you know, the things I saw in anarchism that was valid, you know, that had nothing to do with the simplistic ideas that it just was about violence and, and killing the ruling class figures and, and it was just about you know, disorganization and, and you couldn't build anything with anarchist principles and this, that, and the other. And um, so that um, set me off in a direction to where when I got to the point 10 years after reading, 10 years after discussions and studying, then I wrote a book called Anarchism and the Black Revolution. And I wrote it from the standpoint that there was a revolution taking place in America. That's what I call it. And let me just say this, <clears throat> if in Russia, for instance, you, you called the 1905 revolution a revolution based on what it, what it had done, how it disrupted the regime, and so forth. Clearly, what happened in the 1960s, or what was happening in the 1960s with the Black Power Movement, even with the New Left, and so forth, clearly it, it, it was um, <clears throat> one of the most serious, or the most serious challenge in the history of the United States. I know there are other things to point to, you know, the, the Civil War, and so forth, and so on, but I can't get into that right now. But in, this is in my mind. This is what I was thinking. And uh, clearly, I thought that the anarchist movement should have been relating to what was happening to both uh, black people in the metropoles, but also black and, and other peoples of color that was fighting European colonization. I felt like that the anarchist movement should be talking about this. The anarchist movement should be uniting with this. And they weren't. They were ignoring it, or they just had no knowledge of it, whatever the case. 
it, it, it was a Eurocentric position. And I started fighting it within the anarchist movement, or ideologically debating it. And um, at one point, I was the most hated man <laughs> inside the anarchist movement in the United States, I guess you could say. Um, I was called all kind of names and claimed I hated white people and as if that had something to do with it, and, uh, and so forth and so on to try to discredit me and, and discredit what I was trying to say. I wanted to bring in more people of color into the anarchist movement. I wrote proposals for it. People rejected proposals inside the uh, IWW and other organizations. They rejected those things. And they um, put me in a position with so much hostility, I, I had to understand and realize that these people were not going to help me build any kind of entity with black people in it inside the anarchist movement. And so this is when I went over to start working towards creating and building an autonomous black movement. And we called it black autonomy. But there was some politics behind it. Uh, one is that I had learned and others had learned, and I'm sure Modibo can talk about this, that that period of the creation of the black movement was a, um, a statement that, because up, up, I don't know, up to the 60s, most radical tendencies thought, white radical tendencies thought that um, black people weren't capable of anything but creating a so-called racial consciousness or a racial movement. That we weren't capable of, build, of, of winning allies or, or, or educating uh, large numbers of, of other oppressed peoples and, and you know, having the ability to have some kind of a revo leader revolutionary uh, movement to freedom. And understanding this, you know, and then experiencing this thing inside the anarchist movement that when, I, when I came out of prison and so forth, I decided to create, not knowing exactly how to create a movement, but create a formation, and I called it Black Autonomy. Now, I work with other people and all that, and that's another story altogether, but I didn't know what the hell I was doing sometime. Um, I'd never been a leader, wasn't seeking to be a leader, and, and so forth, but I did know one thing. I wanted it to be a grassroots movement because of what I learned in SNCC and, and, and so forth, that it's the masses that make the revolution. And so I wanted it to be a movement that whether I lived or died or went back to prison or whatever, some, the people could take it over. They could take it over and uh, do something with it, you know what I'm saying, and lead it on. And, and I've always thought that this was the way to do things. And um, there's a lot of, um, as the brother would say, a lot of bullshit around that people <laughs> want to lead you to think that, that there's some so-called messiah or some leader or some, or we should be fighting to put somebody in power. You know, of course, the electoral people tell us this. You expect that. But the, the, the so-called leftists and radicals and so forth over the, over the years of my life even uh, have said the same thing. You know, we, we build movements. We, we're trying to let the people know about our leaders and so forth. There's been attempts to create the Black Panther Party, recreate it 25 times. I, I shit you not, 25 times people have tried to create a Black Panther Party and failed dismally because they weren't trying to uh, do, feed people or, or, or they weren't trying to you know, build a program of the, for the masses. They were building a program just for their leaders to get photogenic attention or, or political attention, whatever. But the point is, um, I learned a, a grave lesson in terms of why we have the situation we do now. One, the racial divisions, why they exist, as I pointed out to you, white people didn't even believe that black people were capable of doing anything. So the 1960s proved a point, just that alone. The, even the civil rights phase, they didn't go and get any uh, uh, white uh, radicals or, or, or uh, professors or somebody to sit in for them and speak, you know, they, and tell the peasants what they should tell them, or tell the poor people what they, they, they did it themselves whether it's the SNCC or even Dr. King's group. I remember, I remember the time Dr. King used to go down to go into a new city and go into the um, uh, pool hall 
and talk to young people and stuff like that and win people over. You know, so he, the, the newspapers and all this never have given us any real understanding of what the black power movement was like. Um, they've never given us any understanding what the 1960s was like, what, the, what it really was about. Was, and, and, and the movements was more than the so-called leaders. They were on the local level. The black power movement was a local phenomenon and it was nationwide, it was international. You know what I'm saying, eventually. But, but the point is it started in, in, you know, in, in the neighborhoods and stuff with ordinary people. And whenever she writes it, Sister Jonana's book, <laughs> Uh, driven by the movement, and you know the rest, uh, shows that ordinary people built movements on the, on the ground that mattered a hell of a lot more than the, than the media generated leaders, male leaders for the most part anyway, but what the people did on the ground was the most important element. And what we needed to do was fight against the leaders so that the People could decide what was best for them. You know, so these are the kind of things I learned. And I became an anarchist. Not even just because Martin Sastry asked me to, uh, but because I was able to look at my history, look at the struggle and so, so forth, put it together in terms and sum it up and sum it up, sum it up, sum up the most important things that I saw. And it's always important to be able to compare that with other activists. Of course, I met Sister Joe Nine. I had to convince her about anarchism. She didn't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Anarchism <laughs> has never done nothing for black folks. I don't even know why you open that food with them people. You know? <laughs> but, you know, after a period of time uh, and, and Countless political discussions, some where I had to eat crow, some where, you know, we were able to come to some accommodation, some, some space where we started understanding. And this is what we've had to do uh, in all the years of organizing. And our, our organizing has been grassroots organizing. It has not been just in the universities or something alone or just, you know, a crowd of white folks. And, you know, uh, we, we have white allies and we understand and we value them. But we also understand that we have to use whatever we can get to reach people and educate them so that then they can take the struggle out of our hands. We want young people to take the struggle out of our hands. I don't want to be doing this forever. Uh, at some point, I'm going to have to give it up altogether. Uh, but I want to be able to express my ideas and, and the things I've learned and work with other allies and, and, and give those to the youth and whatever they find of value, whatever they find of value in it, use it and uh, use it to win. And before, before you um, answer that question, Modibo, I want to just um, pull a couple threads from, from what was said so far. And so the question that was uh, being responded to was basically what does anarchism mean to uh, Modibo, Janina, Lorenzo? How do they feel about it? How do they identify with it? And so before, before you jump into that, I just wanted to plug a couple things. I wanted to let people know that if you want to learn more about Martin Sostre, you can go to martinsostre.com where we have the Sostre Institute website. You can read through an archive. You can inter interact with a lot of materials on there, understand more about that, um, that man who he was as a, as a figure in the history of black anarchism. And uh, also Lorenzo was talking about uh, black autonomy and everybody should be encouraged to check out the Black Autonomy podcast with Lorenzo and Janine where they explain more about the details of black anarchism, black autonomy and their past and their organizing. Um, and in terms of what you had said earlier, Modibo, before you answer this, uh, before you answer this question, you had spoken about who writes history and who gets venerated and who gets remembered and um, oftentimes how it uh, falls into this kind of messianic framing of understanding history through these great leaders. And so I think that that is something that's really significant to point to why people like Martin Sostre aren't known or why uh, anarchism could be 
um, interpreted as a white movement despite the origins of uh, anarchists and stateless socialists organizing in Korea, in Japan, in Mexico at the beginning of the, at the uh, beginning of the Mexico, Mexican Revolution with the Magon brothers. Um, there's so much rich history in Russia, uh, the history of anarchists uh, in the Russian Revolution, in Cuba, all throughout uh, uh, Central and South America, there is history of people who are fighting for anarchism in these revolutions that are so heralded. Um, and oftentimes, uh, they are completely erased and distorted from these histories and these movements to the point that people think that anarchism has only ever been interpreted and understood uh, by Europeans and that there is no um, people of color or there's no black people or indigenous people who have ever had any sort of relationship to stateless socialism. So I, I find that uh, particularly relevant to make that point, um, kind of leading into to your response as well. I just want to kind of weave some of those threads in, Modibo. And I know that you've told me before, and I quote you often saying this, that I think I asked you, we were talking on the phone one time, and I asked you if you were an anarchist, and you said, I'm not, um, you said, I'm not an anarchist. You said, I don't run to it, but I don't run from it. And I've, I kind of go around saying that now, and I put that in my writing and in my work. Um, in many ways, uh, I feel like it's a, it's a good way to avoid some of the pitfalls and the trappings of turning anarchism into a rigid dogma, kind of to some of the points you were making, Janina, when you were saying you're not a, can, a card carrying anarchist. I think that you know, there's a risk of people becoming uh, so caught up and so dogmatic and rigid about it as well. And, I just wanted to see kind of if you could expand on your relationship to that word and some of those things that you share with me too, Modibo. Yeah, well, uh, anarchism to me is an, an evolving practice. Uh, I, you should quote me a, a quote, add this to the quote. I don't run to it, I don't run from it, but I practice it. And uh, it's, it's, a demo, it's a direct democratic practice. That's why it turns out to be a political praxis kind of thing. And it evolves, you know, and it changes. Uh, and when you get down to it, it is a demonized word. And that's why we have to, that's why I have to be careful in my own context. Like I remember when Marxism-Leninism was, uh, was a blasphemous kind of term. I remember when, uh, you know, over the last 70 years, uh, I remember when communism was just, uh, and they still try to do it from the far right. They still try to uh, demonize it from the far right. But uh, that, that's been helpful, really, because when, when the ruling class or the bourgeoisie, in our case specifically, say that this is evil, that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to figure out why, is it, if, if it's evil to them, then it must be okay. <laughs> So you have to uh, analyze that. Now, my particular ideological, uh, so much philosophical uh, understanding came as I read Marxist-Leninism, and I got to the point of the future of, of the society where they talked about the seizure of state power and the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And then I, I said, oh, okay, fine. Hold up a second. Hold up a second. We lost you. And they say the state you, will wither away. Hold up a second, Modibo. Can you repeat that back? We lost. No we lost you for a second. States don't wither, and that's where I ran. I ran. I ran. In, I ran into a brick wall in my practice. I ran into a brick wall in my ideological study, and I just could not go any further on that point with the Marxists that the states don't wither away. And every time I look around, just like Lorenzo said, every time I look around, the state was on my ass, you know? <laughs> you know? And every time I look around, my problem was with the state. And well, they say, it's the bourgeois state. No, no, states are states. They are class instruments, and they will kick your ass. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry to get, get so down like that, but anarchism to me is a social practice and it's an ideological pursuit. And uh, every time I look around, I mean, what, what, in Jim Crow, what was it? It's a local state, and of course, black people took care of that. But uh, the state is a bitch, man. <laughs> it tells you, and it never tells you what you can do. It always tells you what you couldn't do. 
It always tells you what you couldn't see. It always tells you what you couldn't think. And so, hell, I'm a thinker. I'm going to think. I'm going to do some shit. And I want to say some shit. And it does. It stops me from doing all of it. <laughs> but it's a, it's a pleasure being on this panel with y'all, though. I, I love you, you know. I love you. See, I'd like to hear a cowboy talk. Because <laughs> I can listen to him all day long, you know what I mean? Because it's like talking to myself. <laughs> I, know, I know you do that a lot at home. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It is, it is it's, it's, it's really wonderful um, to have this conversation. It's really inspiring to hear, hear what y'all are, uh, are, are explaining and, and unpacking for, for us all. And I want to ask some more targeted uh, questions. And just to kind of uh, let everybody know where we're at time-wise, I think we got about an hour left. So maybe I'll just ask a few targeted questions, and then we can kind of have a more open dialogue, and everybody else can um, jump in. I don't. Don't want uh, the conversation to be too exclusive. Uh, can you tell me, Lorenzo specifically? Um, can you tell me um, what is the difference between Black anarchism and classical anarchism? You know, Black anarch Black anarchism comes out of a different uh, historical, uh, certainly economic, and and political. Uh, background is what's happening to black people. And as I was saying that um, the anarchist movement that I ran into in the 19, uh, well, I got out in 1984, I think it was. And there were no black people in the anarchist movement. I mean, none. I never ran into another black person I know people claiming now that it was some committee of people and some personality of folks and all. I ain't never met them. I haven't met nobody. I hadn't met anybody. I met Ashanti 20 years ago. <laughs> I mean, that's just how few black people there was in the movement. And um, it um, was not a popular tendency uh, when I came along, you know, so black anarchism developed uh, in not, well, not totally in isolation because um, there were other countries that had established anarchist movements that had been in struggle, you know, and they still had some of those elements, you know, the CNT and, uh, for instance, in Spain has always been very good to me in terms of, you know, uh, helping me get out of prison and 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 supporting uh, the things I was saying, you know, um, in the United States. Uh, at the time that the anarchist movement was in existence, it was mainly a, and you're not going to attest to it, a prankster movement, sort of, if you, if you want to, uh, a, it was, you know, a, a white uh, a cultural tendency and, and so forth. And you had the, the zippies and the yippies and the whatever and the hell else. And I just didn't identify with it. Most black people didn't identify with it. So, um, we created black anarchism, and what black anarchism is, is a amalgam of revolutionary ideas. One I would say is, uh, it recognizes socialism. Uh, there's always been a different um, current of socialism with, with, with anarchism. Um, there's always been a different um, conception about the state. Black people have always felt that the state uh, was what we should be fighting, not uh, fascist groups in the street. I've had that one thing has been a fight for years. Uh, so that was one of the things that led me to considering, look, I'm not going to be able to just be part of this. I'm not going to be a diverse person or whatever within the, this movement. We've got to build something independent. So. We're talking about a, a, a grassroots movement, a, a movement that recognizes grassroots struggles. When we created Black Autonomy, our thing was the fight against police terrorism, uh, the fight against poverty, uh, fight against what was happening in, in housing projects and so forth. That's how we, we position ourselves. And of course, I got tremendous grief for that from all kinds of groups, you know, nationalist organizations and, and other, uh, you know, radicals and so forth. All this stuff was ridiculous. It was, was nothing but social work and so forth and so on. But this is what the people were. The people were down, and I was one of them. I was on the bottom, you know. 
uh, almost homeless, nothing to eat, uh, didn't have, uh, you know, very many allies, but we organized something from the grassroots. You know, Adib Medibo, when they were getting ready and trying to close down the uh, Capitol Hill, you remember Capitol Hill Homes in yeah, Atlanta? I know Capitol. Yeah, Capitol Homes, I'm sorry. Uh, we got involved in a struggle to prevent that. And we got in a struggle to prevent, around the time of the, uh, the, the Olympics, right before the Olympics, they tried to jack the uh, price uh, of the tickets, you know, the transit, transit system, and have, have it go up to uh, 250 or something like that from a dollar, I think it was at the time. And we had a struggle against that and, uh, and beat that back for years. And so, and it was started in Atlanta. We started Black Autonomy in Atlanta. And a lot of the things that you know we did, uh, we didn't have any um, media coverage, or we didn't have any any you know a bunch of allies jumping to Russia to, to help us do it, because most of them thought electoral politics is the way forward. You know they thought that, that was what we what you did, and we were trying to create on a grassroots yeah. level a mass movement. What's that? A mass movement. How are you doing? That could uh. Good. Uh, what? Oh, okay. All right, when we created the grassroots movement, uh, and, and, and so black anarchism was more, to us, and it's, there's different conceptions now, but it wasn't a nationalist, it wasn't inspired by nationalism uh, or, or some kind of you know, uh, narrow uh, perspective as we were always accused. It was in fact um, based on the, the radical elements within, uh, within uh, black history, like like SNCC and like, like other movements that were based in the grassroots struggles in the civil rights period and so forth. And so it was a continuation of that. It was new ideas. It was ideas from anarchist politics, from anarchist theory. Some people now claim that if you were an anarchist or called yourself an anarchist somehow and you're black, somehow you were selling out to a white idea. But as you point out, there have always been peoples of color in the movement or inspiring the movement or writing about it, even people that don't call themselves anarchists. Well, I do call myself an anarchist, but I'm saying that people who don't and didn't back in the day, they still made a tremendous contribution. And it's really important to understand that. Janina, I wanna ask you a, 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 a bit of a two-pronged question. I wanna ask, um, if we can uh, really bring gender into the discussion, and I want to ask you, how do you, how do you relate uh, to anarchism and the thinking from the experiences uh, that you had as a woman in the Black Power movement and in the party? Um, what what it, can you speak to some of your experiences around gender, and can you also maybe offer some? some guidance for the younger generation in terms of some of the pitfalls that we can, can, that we can avoid um, if we are to think about maybe some of the principles of anarchism to avoid getting caught up in some of the pitfalls that you saw within the Black Power Movement. So can you speak to that gender point and then to avoiding some of the pitfalls of uh, the sort of hierarchical top-down organizing that you saw up close and personal in the party? Okay, well, if we had, is that better? Yeah, if we had six or seven hours, I could really answer that, but I'll do, I'll do my best, you know, in a few minutes. Um, you know, the whole thing about gender, one of the, when, the, when the black power movement was really, uh, you know, developing in the country, of course, you had a lot of stuff happening in America, and the women's, uh, and I, you know, the, the white women's liberation movement was developing, and I say that, because the women's liberation movement that first kind of came to the fore in this country uh, did not address the issues that black women had. This is, this is a case of where, again, black women had to have autonomy. We had to form our own movement because you know, we experienced things that you know, white women did not. We experienced racism, you know, obviously sexism, but we also experienced racism. So um, one of the things that, uh, in the early days of the white women's liberation movement, for me, uh, that movement was um, 
irrelevant also. It was irrelevant to me as a young black woman. And uh, I, I know I shared this story yesterday, but I'm going to briefly share it again. A sister who was in the black power movement, and she's a little bit older than I am. By the time we get to the black power movement, um, she, was, she was married. Uh, she had three little boys, right? Now, she was a feminist, and she was, an, a, she was a you know, revolutionary uh, uh, you know, black activist, but she said that she could not relate. She's a black woman. She said she could not relate to the white feminist movement because they were out there having marches and protests burning bras. And she was like, well, I got three little kids, and I'm a married woman. You know, what the hell do I care about burning some damn bras? That has nothing to do with my existence, my life as a black woman, you know, it's irrelevant to me. And I, we understand why those kind of things were done, but they were not meeting as I, you know, my expression I like to use is bread and butter issues of black women. Burning a bra did not relate to that. And also there was a certain segment of the white, limit, white women's liberation movement that, uh, you know, didn't like men. There, there was that segment, a certain hatred of men. And, you know, black women, you know, we have, we have issues with the brothers, but we didn't hate them. You know, we recognized that we were in this struggle with them, and we weren't going to deal with the hatred. We knew we had to deal with our differences and pro problems that we had. So you talk about gender. That's one of the first things I remember about as being a young black woman, you know, 23, 24 years old, when the white feminist movement was coming about. In the Black Panther Party, uh, you know, people in the Black Panther Party, except for maybe two people that I knew who were in it, that I personally knew who were in it, who were not born in the United States. There was one brother who came from Canada. Uh, we came from the United States of America. We were born here. This is a, a, a white supremacist, patriarchal society. This is what we grew up in. You know, we did not, so we brought all that stuff with us into the Black Panther Party. We did not, uh, we were not revolutionaries when we joined, is it off? Covering it up? Okay. We, did, we were not revolutionaries when we joined the Black Panther Party. We came into the Black Panther Party as black people raised in the United States of America. And we brought all the issues that this, you know, white supremacist, patriarchal society has with us, okay? So, um, there is, a, you know, we, we dealt with sexism and patriarchy in the Black Panther Party. Yes, we did. We weren't any different than any other organization. You know, there are some people who, a, a lot of people on, on the left, it seems like right now, want to talk about the degree of which women in the Black Panther Party were oppressed. Well, yes, you know, we dealt with patriarchy, but this did not happen in every single chapter of the Black Panther Party. We had different chapters in different cities and branches. So it depended on what city you were in, okay? So it did not deal it was not present in every city and in every chapter, but we dealt with it because we were in the United States of America, and that's what kind of society this is, right? So don't, don't look upon us, don't fault us as being uh, so bad because we had patriarch or patriarchy in the Black Panther Party. That, that shit came with, came with us in t into the party, okay? So that's one thing uh, to remember, and we had to struggle with it. Um, However, the other thing to remember about the, to know about the Black Panther Party, the Black Panther Party lasted as long as it did because of the sisters. Because, that's right, you can go ahead. <laughs> because of the sisters. Many of the brothers got locked up, arrested, had to go underground. But it was the women, and you can read about this, uh, uh, Sister Angela Davis, who's an historian of the Black Panther Party, she, I first met her in the early 80s. She did her, I think it was her master's thesis on uh, dealing with uh, uh, women in the Black Panther Party and all the work that they did in terms of the programs. It was women in the Black Panther Party. Uh, when we uh, did get, uh, we had a period in which we were involved in electoral politics, and that's another discussion. But when that did happen, uh, it was women who organized the work in terms of, you know, getting the vote out to getting the corrupt mayor that we helped get elected, but we had a reason to get him elected. We were trying to bring Huey Newton back from Cuba. So, you know, he used us, but we used him too because we were trying to, you know, get, get Huey back. But it was women who organized, you know, the electoral campaigns. It was, it was women who ran the, the chapters and the branches of the Black Panther Party 
when the brothers got locked up, okay, or had to go underground. I mentioned this before, and excuse me for repeating it, but here in Detroit, uh, I wound up driving in the Black Panther Party busing the prisons program. We didn't actually have buses. We used cars, but I wound up driving in that program because most of the brothers who were in the party at that time had lost their driver's license or they were on parole or they were underground, whatever. The, the brothers just didn't have driver's licenses. We had to get on the highway to drive to the prisons. So, so one thing to, to, to know is that the women kept the Black Panther Party going as long as it did. So I don't want people to think that there was so much repression of women or oppression of women. It wasn't any more than it was in any other left organization that was going on. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that Lorenzo belonged to, they had problems with the patriarchy and they had to have, they even had to call the whole meeting to deal with it, you know. But just know that, the, that women in the Black Panther Party, we kept it going, okay? We kept it going. It would not have lasted from 1966 until the spring of 1981 if it had not been for women. So never forget that. Whatever other stuff you may read, please remember that, okay? It was, it was the sisters. It was the sisters. And um, I, think, I can't think of anything else I want to say about that. I, I did want to make sure I mentioned that, though, because I'm, I'm kind of disturbed now about all I'm hearing about, all the discussion about how women in the Black Panther Party were oppressed and all that. And, and yes, we struggle with it, but don't, let, don't, don't, don't think that that shut us up completely. Okay, all right. Modibo, uh, I want to ask, ask you this question, and I, it's, it's also maybe a, a multi-pronged question. You, you, said, you said a couple things about uh, direct democracy. It's been mentioned, I think, a few times while we've been talking today. And a lot of times, I think that um, when people hear the word democracy, they, they get turned off because they associate it with the, the propaganda of the US state thinking about um, imperialism and how democracy is used uh, as a word to reinforce the imperialist interests of uh, the US state. So I wanted to ask you if you could kind of explain and break down what you mean when you say direct democracy and how it relates to this discussion about anarchism. And I'm gonna also ask you to, I know that that's a very long, long answer. I'm gonna ask you to keep it concise and don't get mad at me if I cut you off. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm gonna be very concise. <clears throat> American democracy is indirect democracy, it's Republican democracy. It's a system whereby people uh, are allowed to vote for candidates who've already been chosen and anointed by the ruling class. And so you have a less minority rule. And so we have to debunk this democracy, American democracy, Republican democracy. When I say Republican, I mean, a republic is a type of capitalist state that is um, politically organized in such a way that a legislative body has great control or, or makes laws and determine what goes on. So what they do is they come up with all kinds of uh, philosophical reasons for that to justify why they think that it's an ideal form of democracy. And it's not, it's never been. Uh, as I say in my uh, last book, the, the American democracy is built on the basis of destroying direct democracy of the native people. American democracy and Republican democracy has never been uh, any form of democracy that we can uh, put our, put our, put our uh, really best uh, interest in. And, and that's very simple. I, I think people realize that. Uh, they talk about the social contract. When you study political science in a university or somewhere, they'll tell you that American democracy is democracy. 
it's the same kind of thing that they do when they try to say that this is our government. It ain't your government. It's never been your government, you know? And that, 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 that's a, a propaganda effort to get people to identify with this form of government. And they call it democracy. And they, and they talk about it as an ideal form. And that's, the, that's, that's the end of history. That's when everybody in the world has, has a democratic state defined as a republic. And to me, that's what we're fighting against. Now, what, what direct democracy does, it's opposed to that. And so at the local level, people come face to face with one another. They create the institutions based upon their uh, direct uh, decision-making uh, institutionalized form that they create. They uh, devolve the central state into them. And then they create a, a network of these kinds of social formations and liberate themselves, not through a state, but through the social formations linked with democratic democracy. Uh, Huey Newton, uh, who was really not a good example of a democratic leader, but Huey, Huey Newton uh, kind of saw it when he talked about intercommunalism. Uh, and people can stumble on stuff and, and he began to talk about it. Uh, he didn't take it too far, but he, 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 he broke ground there. And that's what I mean by direct democracy. And so in direct democracy uh, is my way of practicing what other people call anarchy. You know, it's as simple as that. I mean, you know, you, you do what Lorenzo does and I do what Lorenzo does. You know, you uh, directly uh, form, help form these uh, types of institutions with direct democratic uh, uh, direct democratic foundation and you, you let the people take you forward <laughs> you don't lead the people you just get in there with them i mean you, you express your own ideas too now in those kind of contexts and you help you move forward and uh people will begin to see how they themselves can govern in that fashion and it's not a it's, it's very simple uh but it's only simple if you can see it it's just like just like I say in another place, uh, a mystery is simply, is simply a, a, a something that is temporarily hidden. So what we have to do is uncover these mysteries so we can understand how to govern ourselves directly. Beautiful. I want to say a quick, one of those, a quick thing about gender. Definitely. Anytime you have a hierarchical organization, you're going to have racism, you're going to have gender, and you have big problems of uh, people thinking they're better than other people, people thinking they know more than other people. So you have to be aware of all of that. I mean, but it's a, the artifact of it is, is, the basis of it is hierarchy, which is held into place by a state, be it, <clears throat> be it national or local or intermediate, it's held together by a state. Is that, that too much? No, no, no. You were. Good. I was just seeing if you were done. I appreciate it. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I think that um, everything that y'all are saying has probably offered a lot of uh, things to the whole room. I don't want to dominate um, the questions too much. I wanted to offer uh, to open up the space and allow folks to kind of have more of an open dialogue and conversation with these um these, these folks up here, these elders up here. Um, Let me ask Lorenzo a question. Can I ask Lorenzo a question quickly? What? Yeah, yeah. All right, man. You ever heard of C.L.R. James when you were younger? Yeah. What do you say, brother? Have you ever you heard of C.L.R. James when you were younger? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Did y'all call him an anarchist? Well, I never heard him called an anarchist, but but you know there were different types of uh, libertarian yeah, right. socialists. Libertarian yeah. socialists, they were different types. Yeah. They used calling uh, the 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 so-called left elements used anarchism as a, um, a form of disrespect of his of his ideology. <laughs> um, but um, he was in fact a libertarian socialist. Uh, and and his breaking away from Stalinism was was kind of uh, 
uh, powered by that. You know, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was yeah, what was led him to, to those beliefs. And he influenced me as, as well as other young activists, you know, as, as a stage of understanding uh, what anarchism was or what they were projecting that to be, as well as what uh, other, other ideological opponents used it for against a figure uh, like C.L.R. James, who I have great respect yeah. for, and had, I had many of his books myself. Yeah, okay, good. All right, we're going we're gonna to dive into the Q&A now. Go ahead. Oh. We got a question. Firstly, I just want to say thank y'all. Um, so much deep respect to the work that y'all have done, um, specifically in terms of like pushing black anarchism forward in the broader um, struggle for black liberation. So yeah, thank you, Medibo. Thank you, Janina. Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, my question has to do with some things that I noticed a lot on the broader, more visible black left um, within this empire. And there's just still, there being this struggle, this internal struggle against authoritarian rule. And, you know, listening to y'all talk about the way that authoritarianism um, kind of and dog, dogmatic leadership kind of like manifested and materialized um, within certain chapters of, of BPP. Um, and within the black power struggle itself, you, Medibo, um, with the Black League, or the Revo Revolutionary League of Black Workers. Um, and so my question is also two-pronged. So like, how did y'all organize um, internal to, to the, in, in, internal to where y'all was seeing, you know, authoritarianism and dogmatic leadership? Like, what did it look like to, uh, to organize against these charismatic leaders? Um, and, um, if there was like any confrontation, like what was what did that confrontation look like? Um, and uh, my second question has to do with just the way that again I see like um, I feel like back in the day, like the the formations that were organized during the Black Power movement look very different, obviously, from how um, you know formations are organizing. And I think that the nonprofit industrial complex, with it on the rise, like has created a different way of. Uh, a different form of black leadership that has uh, that also too has a very authoritarianistic tendencies, um, especially for more petite bourgeois black leaders who kind of like parachute into communities that are already self-organized and because they have the resources, so they're getting like foundation funding, and they're coming into these communities and they're like, we have the answer: it's state communism, it's state socialism, and the people who are already organizing in in these communities. Um, are just like fighting back against this this these doc, this dogmatic leadership and against people who are and they're out resourced by these authoritarian leaders and I understand that may have looked a bit different back in the day because again now with like the rise of foundation funding more of these authoritarian leaders have the resources to to kind of like you know materialize their own desires and aren't really listening to people on the ground. Um, you know, in terms of, of, of the Black Panther Party, uh, you know, the Black Panther Party, uh, in, at least in, in, in Oakland, California, uh, and, and sort of the model it adopted, uh, was an authoritarian organization. Uh, it did great things, it did wonderful things, I love the party, but it was authoritar authoritarian in its structure. Because it, it thought, at that time, you know, you had the the, our models were the Mao, Mao and the Chinese Revolution and the, you know, and the, uh, you know, uh, in, in the Soviet Union, the model they had there. Uh, you know, we didn't know all this stuff about Stalinism that came out later on. So those were our models, okay? So, uh, and those were authoritarian models. So we were, we were, we had a central committee in the Black Panther Party, which, you know, would give directives and you know, you're t or you had a coordinator in your area of work, and you were told what to do, and you were supposed to to follow the directive. And we, because we were told that we were at war with the United States government, and that we had, if we were given a directive, we had to be just like we were on the battlefield, you know, with a gun on in our in our arms fighting. We had to follow those directives. So uh, because of all those types of influences. Um, uh, we were structured as an authoritarian uh, organization, at least the, the central leadership. Now, I can't, I'm not going to speak for every chapter and branch of the Black Panther Party in the United States because it's wrong to say that they were all the same and all did everything the same way. But I'm going to tell you what, 
you know, I experienced most of my time was in Oakland, California at the central headquarters, okay? So that was a serious problem for us, authoritarian structure. And uh, in terms of, you know, you ask about what do we do to organize or fight against it? Well, I'm sorry to say that in Oakland, at least, I can't speak for any place else in Oakland, we did not organize to fight the authoritarian structure. We did not fight it. Uh, uh, you know, we, most of us were afraid to do that. Uh, we thought we would be betraying the struggle because we would be going against our, the leaders who were leading us on, on the battlefield. I mean, we literally believed we were on the battlefield against the United States government. And we felt that it would be, you know, uh, a betrayal for us to organize ag against the leadership. Now, you know, in hindsight, you know, that was wrong. If we, if we had organized against, uh, you know, that hierarchical structure, the Black Panther Party might have, might have actually been able to transform into something else at a later point uh, that might have been even bigger than what we had. So I'm sorry that we did not, uh, you know, I can't blame us because, well, I can, I understand it, but I am sorry that we did not. So what I, my lesson from that is, is that if you are find yourself in a hierarchical organization now, um, to, you know, nip that in the bud as quickly as you can, if you see that coming into your organization, uh, people, uh, you know, the rank and file, you know, I was a rank and file member of the Black Panther Party, rank and file people who are, because uh, we use those terms just like the Communist parties did in Russia and in China. We, we were trying to be like them. So the rank and file membership, you have to speak out and organize against that promptly and, and to keep it from developing because authoritarianism will destroy your organization. And that certainly was not the only thing that led to the destruction of the Black Panther Party. We can't discount the role of the FBI counterintelligence program and other programs, but it played a significant role in the ultimate, you know, uh, you know, demise of the Black Panther Party. Speak out, do not let authoritarianism develop in your organizations. If you don't nip it in the bud right away, you will cease to exist. <clears throat> that, that question also raised uh, uh, the question of the rise of electoral politics. And um, electoral politics was part of the, uh, really, I've always said, and you can believe it or not, it was up to you, but I've always said it was part of, in fact, the counterinsurgency. Um, it changed the direction of a, uh, what was then a revolutionary mass movement in the 1960s towards uh, Co cooperating with the state, leading us to, e they even use entrepreneurialism, uh, black capitalism from the Nixon administration uh, to destroy the, the, the radical wing of black power, and, um, and including the Black Panther Party, but it was another set of tactics they used on the Black Panther Party. We have electoral politics as a means of pacification, political, it was, it rose because of political pacification. They wanted to say we had representation. And <clears throat> I'll never forget um, when the uh, rebellion broke out uh, in, um, what was that in, in, uh, in, in Missouri? Oh, Ferguson. Ferguson. Yeah, the, the rebellion broke out in Ferguson and some guy who was a city council member or was running for city council came out and said, you don't have to rebel. Why, we've got representation for you. We're, we've got representation for you. Why, vote for me and I'll set you free. <laughs> I'm serious. His, his name was French. He was, he was in the city council or running for the city council. I can't be clear. But I, he got up and actually said that. He actually said that his own, went on CNN and all the you know, the capitalist news media channels and all that stuff. <clears throat> but it just is a reflection of how the government has used um, electoral politics. Now, you understand Malcolm X was talking about electoral politics when he came here to Detroit. He talked about the ballot of the bullet. He, you know, he's, now I've always thought, you know, that um, he was speaking directly to the government. And I'm sure they thought that too. And he was saying that, that there's going to be more and more f 
uh, fires every summer, you know, uh, radical, uh, so-called racial riot fires every summer if you don't do something to uh, reform this system. He said, I don't care if you do or not. I let the young blacks burn this motherfucker down. <laughs> you know, that's that's his, effectively his position. But, and, and I'm, it's simplistic in what I'm saying, but it always has been used as a tool to prevent radical and militant protest. You don't have to do anything. You, you've got representation. Why, go out and join the Democrats and get out there and get elected. And that's been said over and over again. I've, I've heard this innumerable times in innumerable settings when people are in the street protesting, somebody get up and inevitably say that. And I'll have you know I'm running for a Congress or I'm running for a city hall and you don't have to be out here and you don't have to struggle and sweat and, 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 and all this. You can just vote for me and I'll, I'll carry out your program. And that doesn't happen. That rarely ever happens because they are part of a system that compromises them. Even if they came in as radicals, they will be compromised because of the system. And so uh, this is what and that's one of the reasons also I'm an anarchist, because the anarchists don't believe in electoral politics or the electoral state or the state at all. Modibo, you got purged from the league. Do you want to explain how you can get purged? But, <laughs> Why don't I call it out the hierarchy? <laughs> you want to, you want to anyway, tell us how to get purged? <laughs> that's the best thing that ever happened to us, getting purged. Because then we went... Uh, to the community and formed an organization, a study group. And uh, it's a really good function. To, we, we were very effective, I thought. Uh, we had no name, but but when people who were active in blacks, trying to get black studies at Wayne State or University of Detroit, or even factory workers who came to us, or police refreshing people always came to us. Uh, uh, I remember we had a real confrontation in the study group between these guys who were busting these um, these uh, dope houses. Dope houses were a new phenomenon then. This was in the 19, 1970s when it was. And uh, these guys, the Brown, Boyd, and Bethune, they were part of our study group. And uh, they, they, they would say, well, we're going we're gonna to go out here and bust some of these houses. So they went out and just got guns and busted them, you know? But, but uh, uh, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't tell them to do it or not to do it. We, we had all kind of different activists, and we read uh, uh, generally the literature which they wanted to read. So we were conduit of all of that. Now, after I left Detroit, we went down to Atlanta. Now, Atlanta is a tough place to organize because the strength of the petty bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie was very, very strong there. But anyway, we had to establish an independent group of people, independent of what they were doing. And so, there were some people trying to get Maynard elected president. I mean, well, he, <laughs> he acted like a president. And Maynard elected mayor, Maynard Jackson. So we were sub we established the Black Issues Community Forum. We tried to show how that was a limited option, and we tried to focus on rent strikes and just anything that the people brought to us. And we met in the basement of Jose's church, Jose Williams' church. But it was a group of us that assembled there, and uh, we were known to be uh, open to any kind of suggestion that people had. I remember one time in one of the projects, they had uh, the people had uh, they had raised the uh, the light bill or something like that, and so the people came and we discussed it, and they came up with an ingenious plan to any time they disconnected the lights, that they could go back and connect the lights again. So to me, that was self-organizing of the masses. You know, they kept doing that and kept doing that until they uh, reduced the price again. And of course, that never made the, the, the headlines. So we, we kept that cadre, that group of people together for a while. And uh, then they brought all kind of issues to us. That's how we got involved in the Bat Patrol. That's how we got involved in the support of the uh, garbage worker strike. And that's how we got involved in the uh, desegregation at the University System of Georgia. The people brought that to us. And we were studying and discussing. And we just a study group, that's all. And uh, it works. 
<laughs> it works. As a matter of fact, this is this is what we're doing here now, as a matter of fact. <laughs> you know, trying to review what practices and what options and what's good and what's bad, what we did right, what we did wrong, what are the possibilities, what are not what what are not an option, but we aren't telling anybody what to do. <laughs> yeah. Open a bookstore like Shastri did. He did bet more good than the Communist Party in Chicago. <laughs> even though he was in Buffalo. But so the point, the point I'm getting at is, that's my style of work, to get people to know. Now, this is what I'm writing now. I'm writing a history of direct dem democracy from the time of the first big empires and show that direct democracy has been a part of human society for the last 20,000 years. So that people won't think this is some alien bullshit, that it's part of being human. It's a part of loving your neighbor, really. It's a part of loving and loving your people. That's all it is. You know, so you write those things and you discuss those things with people. You come on forums like this and you share wisdom and try to get some understanding. And, 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 and it just never, democrat, never denigrate anybody's attempt to try to learn something about the social movement of human beings on the planet here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it makes a difference. You, you, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, you know. Okay. Thank you. Um, we got one person I know who was in queue on, uh, on Zoom, and we got, a, got some people in line. So, Abe, can you unmute and ask your question? And then maybe we can get this next question, and then we can just throw them all in the mix. Abe, if you want to unmute and ask. Okay, sure. Thanks. Well, the first part... Uh, maybe mostly for Lorenzo here. I was wondering, can you speak to the concept of the black commune? Do you see that um, egalitarian income sharing communes are a useful tool for creating your vision for the ultimate goal of the black commune you envision? And then the second part would be um, people speaking to the um, Black Panther Party's um, experiments with communalism. I believe there might have been a commune in Oakland. Um, so yeah, that's that's the question. Okay, and if we can get an, another question at the mic too, I just want to have it kind of all all in the mix at once, so we can just have y'all speak freely. You have? Did you have a question? Sure. Yeah. So. Okay. Hi. First, thank you. Um, I really appreciate um, everybody's time. My question, um, especially, so when we're talking about like statelessness and like that, I kind of like inherent category as a black person. Um, I come from a right lineage where my mom's Jamaican, my dad's a man from the black south in America. And one of the things that I often hear silences around in the discussion about like black power movements in the United States um, is that diasporic connection. And like, you know, we're often talking about like the Russians or the Spanish or the this or the that, but we very often re like don't very frequently reference like black, like free, the movements in other diasporic contexts and like how that informs movement work. Um, and I, I think we do it to a detriment, especially like I kind of look around right now and see like in the rise of like a certain kind of black nationalism that takes on the language of white supremacy and becomes real dangerous. Um, and I think at odds with our freedom. And so I'm just kind of wondering in terms of your perspective, like having done this work historically and like knowing even that a lot of the characters in the original like black power movements were coming from diasporic contexts, like what's the, what do you think the reasonings for behind some of that silencing is? And then how do we move beyond some of those in modern contexts so that we're not seeing, you know, it's not the same thing where we're looking at like immigrants to this country who are also from suppressed, colonized, like settled nations, and as black people looking at them as our enemies rather than white supremacy. So Lorenzo, do you want to answer that first question with regard to speaking to the black commune? And uh, then maybe we can have y'all just kind of generally respond to the next question about the, the diaspora connections and so on. You know, at least my ideas about um, the, a black commune 
uh, and, and some organizers, revolutionaries that I've seen over the years talk about it, is uh, to take the black community and turn it into a self-sufficient and uh, radical entity that is uh, in opposition to the government. We talk about dual power. Well, uh, the black commune is supposed to be the essence of dual power um, within the context of, of, of you know, the time we were writing this in the, I don't know, the 60s or 70s. And um, so it's not a, some sort of mystifying thing. You know, it's about giving power and building institutions in the community that uh, can challenge the um, existing government framework, whether it's the city government or the state government or whatever. I mean, let me just say it like this now, give you a, a, a concrete example. We're actually facing a form of fascism right now where the state governments have assumed all authority, including taking power even from the cities, where let's say blacks may govern. They've done this in Detroit already. Um, and, it, and they're just at the infantile stage right now of doing it. So we need black people that are living in these cities, especially, you know, if they haven't thrown us out with gentrification. Um, but we need to be able to impact on what these people do and on what the overall government's plan is to get rid of us or whatever, we need to be able to have our own um, mechanism, turn our communities through you know, political education, through organizing, and through uh, other forms of uh, contact with the masses of people, of which we're part, by the way, as activists. We're still part of it, as Jonina always points out to me. We need to be able to turn that into a fight back movement, community-based, instead of having the government fight us, bring in killer cops, bring in social workers, that's what they did back in the day anyway, I don't know what they're doing now, but using these elements of the state to stifle the community. To, the government has created the poverty that exists in the black community. The government has created the so-called gangs and other things that exist today, you know, and, and, and in the past, years past, the government has, has done this. And um, the government has created whatever problems there are with police killings. Those cops are agents of the state and agents of the government directly, you know. And, and so the commune will give power to the people to decide, you know, through direct democracy or whatever, whatever form is there and, and they agree on, to be able to fight back and build counter institutions. Uh, it's an important element um, of, of uh, resisting uh, capitalist oppression, to be able to fight back, to not let them um, come in and poison the water, to not let them come in and uh, shoot and kill 10 kids or, or give out guns so that the kids will kill themselves. That's what's happened by this, at this point, that they, the guns have been given to people to be self-destructive. They gave blankets to the Indians, to the natives, to kill them so they could kill them off, and they give guns to these youth. That's what they've done with the military surplus. But so direct democracy is a way that people can seize power within their context, not power to give it to some politician or give it to some group that wants you know, to create a dictatorship over people, but to put power in the hands of the people themselves so that they decide what it is they want to do and what methods they will use to do it. Um, some of this has been done before. Like, as Brother Medivo always points out, it's been, some of this stuff has been done before. Uh, people were fighting the Ku Klux Klan with armed force. I don't know how many people know this or whatever. They've been fighting the Ku Klux Klan with armed force. That's why you don't see the Klan around much anymore. There's kinda, their kind of outright racism has been defeated. Uh, people have been able to, in, in years past, to push the cops back. Of course, the Black Panther Party was just a... Uh, an example of what came out of the community. It didn't come out of some ivory tower. It came out of the community. 
and other groups, the, the league, I always say that, now I'm sympathetic to the Black Panther Party, so you understand I'm partisan, but I think that the league was, was certainly one of the most important movements out of that period. And somebody was talking to me about syndicalism, anarcho-syndicalism, like it was some kind of mystery thing or something. I said, hell, I said, in Detroit, there was a black syndicalist organization, a revolutionary syndicalist organization that none of you all even talk about or even know about. But just because you don't know about something, you better go ask somebody. You know, <laughs> you can't come in and tell people that, that we don't know anything, that black people don't know anything, uh, that poor people don't know anything, and got to get it from some academic. You know what I'm saying? And the academics ain't never been in, you know, they haven't suffered what you suffered. Thankfully, we would we were won that's an exception. But, but I've, I've had people come up to me and tell me, um, you, you do know you're writing for the, the bourgeoisie, don't you? You're writing for the black bourgeoisie, or you're, write, or you're, you're writing to those elements of the black uh, bourgeoisie, the academic element, that uh, they're the only ones can understand what you're writing. And I had to stop and think about that. I said, I said how do you feel? Like, how do you figure that? I wrote anarchism in the Black Revolution in the penitentiary. And I wrote it with prisoners, you know, feedback, telling me stuff, asking them stuff. And um, they seem to understand it. There's a high level of consciousness in the prisons. And it would have been a hell of a lot more books written from the prisons if it wasn't that been, hadn't been for censorship. So this idea that people can't understand. You know, I'm self-taught. Somebody was using the term I hadn't heard it used in any other conference anywhere. Or autodidactic, I think it is, a self-taught individual, was well, some of the best organizers and the, the, um, the theoretical organizers and, and, and activists have just been people who taught themselves. They taught themselves complicated political theories and so on and so on. And that was the real thing with the Black Panther Party and the Black Panther newspaper. It taught people complicated theories, and then they could turn around and understand it and teach it to someone else. Modibo, do you want to speak to, the, to that second question about the diaspora connections? Do we need to repeat it? Repeated? Well, the second question was about was there a, a, a commune in Oakland? I, I don't know of one. Well, that was the second I, not that second question. The, the, the other question that we had to follow up after that. Do you oh, want to? Do you the wanna... other question was about the uh, about, about the uh, diaspora connection. Right. The, the concept of Pan Africanism was a concept which really uh, came out of the political struggle against colonialism, which was a struggle a uh, di diasporic struggle against classical, you know, against classical col classical colonialism, uh, and but it was statist. That's why I call it classical colonialism and classical pan-Africanism. But uh, neo-pan-Africanism, which I believe exists, is a more non-statist conception of the unity and independence of all African people. But the problem, the problem is, it's hard to think of and to conceptualize African liberation outside of outside of a status a, a status concept. When people talk about black liberation, they talk about establishing a political entity, which they sometimes say is the, a state, or sometimes they say something which, like, which will establish black political power. But um, the question is, the question to me is, we have to conceptualize pan-Africanism outside of a status concept which includes the, um, the diaspora, but it's a people concept, not a, not a unity of uh, governments and states. And that's where I asked, I make a clear distinction between classical Pan-Africanism, like in Krumah and then we're talking about, and neo-Pan-Africanism, which is non-status. But oh. all Pan-Africanism. Gotcha. Uh, I think she was talking about the international dimensions of black power uh, outside of the, just the framework of the United States. Where'd she go? Is, is that correct? 
You, you're saying that you, you're, you're saying sure, it was a movement here within like the bounded understanding of the United States that it was still shaped very much in a pan-Africanist, I guess as Ludivo was explaining it, like less of so a status concept and more of a like right. theolo like a theology that was coming from and in conversation across diasporic contexts. But we don't often talk about it in that way. Right? Like we often talk about black power as like the movement in itself as if it is bounded geographically. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think that when I think <clears> of <throat> like black anarchism, especially in a stateless way, to me there's like a global imagination that I conjure up with people rather than just like on my block, this is what I'm doing. So like, that makes sense. Well, there was an international dimension to the black um, power movement. It was even an international dimension to the Black Panther Party. There were Black Panther parties in seven other countries with different peoples, you know. There, since we, we acknowledge this, uh, there is a Pan-Africanism. There are black people all over the world and uh, they have different cultures. Uh, I was in um, Australia and uh, I was able to meet some of the people that started the Australian Black Panther Party and who were involved in the Australian Black Power Movement. And it, it was just interesting that they were influenced by what happened in the United States, but they took and built their own conceptions of it in, in Australia to, to combat uh, the kind of uh, racial chauvinism they were dealing with that and colonialism. And genocide it also it was part of their process, um, and of course we talk, you know we know about it, I believe we know about the Black Power movement in, in um, um, London and in England, in the UK, uh, which was was very extensive, you know, uh, but was also based around the um, historical legacy of them coming of the people coming from from the Caribbean to. The United States, I'm sorry, to the, to the United Kingdom, and um, and building a culture there of long standing. It, it actually, they've got uh, cultures there as long as the United States, old as the United States. Uh, you know, black neighborhoods and communities. I was living in one at one one time. Uh, so, and then uh, the, the the international dimension where the anti colonial movement and other revolutionary tendencies around the world linked with black power. You know. Uh, these things have not really been studied. If that's what, if, now if this is what I'm answering to, these things have not been studied. Now you did mention about the re some of the reactionary elements within Black Power. Well, every one of these movements, including anarchism, has a reactionary element. I don't even know if people know that there's a so something called uh, national anarchism, which is a fascist movement. Within the, I've, I've been trying to get people to speak out against it for years, and nobody, you know. So, I mean, every movement has a, a reactionary element to it and opportunistic elements that try to make, make money or political capital or whatever, you know. That is, it's not something that's ingrained, is what I'm saying, if you can hear me. Yeah. Okay, then go ahead. Next, next question. So my, my question is coming about from different conversations that I've had that have pushed thoughts that I came into this week-long space with um, as I move my own work, my teaching, and my organizing forward. Um, and I couldn't help but reflect on Ruth Wilson Gilmore's piece in The Shadow of the Shadow State. Um, so, in, and in that piece, if anyone's not familiar with it, she writes extensively on her analysis on the nonprofit industrial complex, and it was for a conference um, by Insight on that topic. And you know, her point was that regardless of the many intents of groups, um, because of the nonprofit industrial complex, they end up enforcing the very structures that they set out to dismantle. And she writes, like, what's wrong is that the work people set out to accomplish is vulnerable to becoming mission impossible under the sternly specific funding rubrics and structural prohibitions that situate grassroots groups in the shadow of the shadow state. 
So I was just wondering what are your thoughts around the nonprofit industrial complex, which came about as a backlash to the movement building in the 70s. Um, and how do we use the tenets of black radical anarchism and direct democracy to avoid being co-opted? Is it possible? Then how? Thank you. Can, can I speak briefly to that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead and answer okay. Modibo, then we'll hear from Janina. Yeah, yeah, well, you simply don't uh, situate yourself where you're accepting the money or accepting the support. Or you look at, this, you get your support from where you get your ideas, and that's from the grassroots black community. Like my work, we've never accepted any money from anywhere. We just accept the ideas of the grassroots people that we work with, as simple as that. And I do, <clears throat> I do recognize the concept for all of that. It's called state creep. If, if, if there's some social motion or some upheaval that has caused great disruption in the state, they will, what we call co-opt it, but also they have methods of co-opting it. They, uh, they send social workers and ideologues of various kinds and they prop them up and you see them on TV all the time talking about what, <laughs> what the movement was doing. And the next thing you know, they are the ones who are getting the money coming in and they're the ones who are doing the spokes, you know, doing the talking. And lo and behold, they're the ones who are writing the history. That's, that's something that we have to face. And I agree with the young woman who wrote that. I mean, that's a problem, state creep. <clears throat> the, uh, the not, you know, the non, the non, non-profit industrial complex was, uh, d you know, deliberately set up uh, when the tax laws in the United States change that allow foundations to begin to fund social justice organizations. And I, um, I don't know, I can't cite all the legislation per se. Lorenzo may want to do that later. He kept up with that better than I did. But at any rate, this was done deliberately to weaken, uh, you know, to take away the possibility of there being any uh, revolutionary grassroots organizations by giving the foundations the tax breaks that they needed so they could fund social justice groups. It was a deliberate thing, uh, you know, it was a, a counterinsurgency, counterinsurgency meaning trying to kill a movement, destroy a movement before it develops. See, the black power movement developed, so the government had to come in afterwards and destroy what was existing. But the tactic now is don't let it develop at all. Okay, destroy, nip, nip it at the bud so it doesn't, doesn't happen at all. And uh, that's one thing to remember about it. So it's a deliberate tactic by the state. And the other thing is, is that, you know, the, uh, we have uh, various uh, nonprofit uh, organizations that are posing to be, you know, you know left, radical, anti-racist, you know, organizations when in fact they got their own problems with white supremacy within those own groups. And Lorenzo's written a pamphlet on that called The Progressive Plantation. You can probably find it online, uh, racism and colonialism inside, uh, uh, what is it, political left organizations? It's, yeah, it's a pamphlet based on his own experience working inside in a progressive plantation, a, on a progressive plantation, I did too myself years ago. A nonprofit organization that claimed to be really left and progressive, and then when they claimed to have run out of money, the last people that they had hired were black people, and those were the first ones that got fired. So that's the other thing to realize about the nonprofit industrial complex. They talk a good game about how we support these these radical social justice issues, but. When they're called on the carpet, uh, they're just as white supremacists and have just as many hierarchical problems as you know corporations do. <clears throat> She's talking about the uh, the 1986 uh, tax code, which was during the uh, what was that the Reagan administration 86? I think it was 86 <clears throat> and. Um, they used, as she was saying, as Jonathan was saying, a comrade Jonathan was saying, um, this was a counterinsurgency move so that the rich could take direct control over uh, social change organizations. Um, people believe that they're doing good, taking 
capitalist money to, um, they say, fight for reforms uh, for poor people. Well, poor people are proven they can fight for themselves. And they don't need the rich man or the white man's uh, ability to do it. They can fight for themselves. So this is just a dirty trick, as a, a one of many, that the rich and their flunkies are using to hold power. And, um, and, and it's, going to be, it's going to result in a, when I say a political bloodbath, I'm not necessarily talking about we're going to come in and gun them down, although that may happen as well. But um, we're going to have to combat these people. We have to keep them out of the community. We have to keep them from co-opting uh, Uncle Tom's and, and, and other um, uh, elements in the, in the community that will collaborate and have historically done that. So the whole thing with that, with that it, it, COINTELPRO had a stage where they wanted, after they killed people and killed movements and, and done all this stuff, that then they would then use this form of financial co-optation to um, manage to keep control, keep authority, uh, keep themselves in power, in other words. And they faced the greatest danger to them, I say, in, in American history. Some people say it may, may have a different assessment, and that's cool, but I believe that it happened in the 1960s uh, with the rise of black power, which was just an, an autonomous movement, basically. And it produced others within it, and other, other tendencies were part of it, and so forth and so on. The New Left is another example. It pushed out the Socialist Workers Party and the, and the rest of these uh, old leftists, the C, CP, and all these groups were made, uh, you know, superfluous or whatever you want to call whatever were, were useless. And um, so the government realized they had a tremendous threat, and this has been their way ever since, ever since, of controlling the situation, you know. And um, the use of money, bribery. I mean, basically, it's a bribe. They give you a grant. Okay, well, here's your grant money, and, and now you belong to us. Motherfucker, you better not do nothing else but what he tell you to do. <laughs> we got your ass right now. <laughs> and I'm saying. Well, yes, that's true, but that's, that's part, of another part of another facet of the program. The main thing is to keep, get, use money to bribe you and to keep you from uh, disrupting society with revolutionary uh, protests and demands. Let me just draw attention to a, a historical, <clears throat> a historical uh, phenomenon that I've observed. They also have these nonprofits that these preachers can get a hold of. Preachers, preachers can um, <laughs> enrich themselves very easily by just stealing the money of the people from through their nonprofit. They don't have to pay no taxes on it. They don't have to pay anything on it. And that's why you have this, this rise of these phenomenally, I don't know what to call them, they're, but, but they're phenomenally spectacular, massive churches all over the place. And they are part Mega of churches. the same process. And of course, they have a, an array of patrons that they send out everywhere. And you see them on TV, you see them all around. And uh, it's, a, it's an amazing phenomenon to behold. And just really to add to that, uh, which what y'all were just saying, um, I think that my generation and the younger generation has really seen this uh, play out horribly with all of the money issues that have come up as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of the mm -hmm. tens of millions of dollars that people have questions about and many of those things were a result of the same pitfalls of things that we saw go wrong within the Black Panther Party with uh, talking about having a, a people-led uh, movement that's not actually people-led, that's actually very hierarchical, and with tons of foundation money coming, miss coming up missing from these national uh, civil rights and black organizations, and this happens repeatedly. And oftentimes I think that, especially with many folks in my generation and, and uh, younger, we oftentimes wonder what could have been done with all that money, with all of that uh, power that had been amassed and centralized in those organizations. What, what could have been done with it that would have 
better served people rather than just talking about it and not actually doing it. So I want to temperature check really quick, and I know we're at time, but I just I'm I don't I don't know how what do you, how does this how do you feel, Mason? So we have some buffer time after this we can bleed into. I think just if we get a show of hands or wiggle your fingers, et cetera, we can spend the next hour in debriefing from the different tours people went on this morning, hearing different uh, aspects of those experiences, sharing them. We can spend it in more conversation with these four folks, or we can do you know some mix. Um, so I'll leave that all up to you. How about um, for those who want to spend more of our time continuing this discussion, uh, can I get some hands? And how about uh, transitioning into follow-up from uh, what we saw this morning? Okay, that looks to me like you've got the floor, and um, you know, feel free to bring it to a close at any point, but... Uh, Okay, well, we can just continue. There's more questions. We can just keep going until folks feel satisfied. Yes, uh, my name is Roberto Mendoza. Hold up, hold up one second. I would actually love some water. <laughs> I appreciate you asking. Thank you. Yes, my name is Roberto Mendoza. I've been in the movement since 1969. And I was also in San Francisco when the Black Panther Party was uh, operating there. And I would, my group would go to the, the Panthers political education classes, and we all sit down and read the little red book. Uh, but then I became involved in the American Indian movement, which was also influenced by the Panthers. And then the Brown Berets were also influenced by the Panthers. And the Young Lords were influenced by the Panthers. So the, all these other groups were influenced to a certain degree by the Panthers and their example of, of working together. And then we had a group in San Francisco that did Breakfast for Children, too, from a Latino group called Los Siete de la Raza. Anyway, uh, I don't like to call myself, well, maybe that's the wrong thing to say, but I prefer to call myself a communalist instead of an anarchist. And I, I say that because Murray Bookchin himself stopped calling himself an anarchist and called himself a communalist because he didn't care for the individualistic aspects of most current, most uh, anarchism at the time, mostly you know, among white anarchists especially, like the Back to the Land movement and, and the Earth First people. But anyway, um, I was wondering if somehow that we can address that question, but the more immediate question I have in mind is, uh, I was wondering if you could get more strength for your movement if you started to look more closely at African-derived values because Afri uh, African American people came from Africa, and though they lost a lot of the connection, the languages, and even what tribes they were in, there still is values that were carried here a lot by the women, especially around growing food and uh, community. And an example of how that worked with Native people is that some of the slaves escaped, when the slaves escaped from plantations in Florida, they would join with the Seminoles and the Seminoles would welcome them because they were also indigenous people, just from indigenous other country, but they had the similar values, earth-centered values. And somehow, I think your, your move, the black movement would be strengthened if somehow they could study those values that came from Africa and, take, like I say, take the best and leave the rest, because not all of them are good, especially the, the thing around kings. Uh, and that might help connect to your roots beyond the United States. The roots are in Africa. Well, all our roots are in Africa, but especially you guys who are African-American, your roots go back to Africa. And there's some strength in there from those values. And uh, an example of what the, the state is trying to do against those values, to distort them, is the movie Black Panther and the so-called Kingdom of Wakanda. You know, they're trying to get you to talk about uh, hierarchical systems and glamorize them. And that's, that's why I didn't want to see the second Wakanda because I'm not interested in you know, seeing kings and queens being the leaders of the new society. But anyway, uh, 
there was one other thing I can't, I can't remember. Well, anyway, that's that's what I would. My question is: Can you connect more with your African values that have survived here in the United States, largely among the women, but continue to operate on a, maybe a subconscious level, and how you could connect with that and make it stronger and strengthen your movement by making that deeper connection. Madiba, do you want to jump on that first? Well, it's all, it's all our movement. Uh, but I, I, I was especially interested in his critique of, of uh, Wakanda with Black Panther. I think he's accu accurate in that, very accurate and very succinct in that. And um, Afrofuturism with kings and queens it's similar to Star Trek, Star, uh, Star Trek with uh, captains and hierarchies for the military. But the point is, <clears throat> the point is that uh, we are all more or less from societies that predated colonialism, wherever it was. Some of the Europeans were, if you study European history, not not the kings now, not the uh, House of uh, Bourbons or anything, but there were communal societies there, and um, you know, the European history is not just the history of the ascendancy of the bourgeoisie and the rise of the plant, uh, the, the feudal lords, which are the which were the plantation owners over there. Uh, they, you know, you you got a history too, you know, the Viking history, the Vikings. Uh, there were communal societies over there uh, that uh, that need to be brought forward as uh, examples of uh, collective, uh, direct democratic uh, social organization. So I would just like you would employ me to look look deeper into my heritage. Well, I'll employ you to look deeper into yours. <laughs> well, next question. Sure. Um... Yeah, I also just want to thank you all for this. It's a real privilege for all of us to be here with you. Um, I've been struck by something listening to you all and also especially reading your book, Lorenzo, in the way that you talk about the evolution of this movement for what you call black autonomy. And what I'm struck by is, is a connection that I'm feeling with uh, the experience, the lessons learned by Kurdish women within the revolutionary Kurdish movement, which is leading, of course, the revolution in Rojava, that they came to this conclusion that while experiencing gender oppression within the movement, even and especially like in the face of other revolutionary comrades, that they came to the conclusion they had to build their own autonomous organizations as a base of, of power, as a counterpower to that oppression that they faced within the movement. And uh, I can't speak for you, but I hear something that, that strikes me as a connection that maybe there's an underlying principle that we all can learn from. And I'm curious if, if, uh, if you see it in this way, because I'm also struck by how much we, in these movements, we're talking about how do we address internal sexism? How do we address internal racism? And we're often talking about it like an accountability process, waiting for a problem to come up when it seems like y'all are really getting more to the root of the problem. So any, any thoughts you have on this, I think we can all learn so much from. Thank you. Hello. All right. Um, yes, I've been saying for years uh, and experienced a very similar situation in terms of the hostility. Uh, one, in terms of the, um, the people who were in the anarchist movement at that time, had the conception of keep anarchism white, keep European domination, blah, blah, blah. And so my approach and, uh, was ultimately that we have to break away from this. We are not be able, we're not gonna be able to convince the majority of white anarchists that um, they should adopt new principles and, and include us at the table it isn't possible to get what they call now diversity, which is meaningless. It just means that you're part of some movement and you have no power, no, no voice. So we created Black Autonomy um, as a study group at first in Atlanta. Um, of course, that enraged these um, 
anarcho, some of these right-wing anarchists that enraged them. And as I told you, there are elements within, and always have been within the anarchist movement, there are some reactionary as, as elements that hated my guts for even being a part of this thing, even though I was just one person and um, one black person. But I started asking for things. Why don't we recruit, recruit more people of color? Why don't we go, I don't want, I'm not saying white people should come into communities and, and, and organize black people, I'm not saying that, but why don't you, you know, use this money you got to help uh, us organize in our communities in, in terms of an act of solidarity. No, wouldn't do that. And then eventually even tried to destroy the uh, campaign and had people attacking us from all over the world. Even white uh, settlers in uh, South Africa claimed to be anarchists were attacking us, one of whom has recently been proven to be a um, white supremacist or an, uh, in the so-called national anarchist movement, which is a fascist movement. So we were forced to, to create a uh, organization, and we called it Black Autonomy. It was a collective at first, a black collective. And it was some students out of the Atlanta, I think it was from uh, Clark Atlanta University, and, and also some activists in the streets, you know, that I had been working with for years. And um, so when, when we did this, we did it with an understanding that we had to create something uh, not totally new, but was independent. You know, that's what we call that autonomy, independent uh, of the, you know, the white structure, even though we were part of a, the movement. I'm still an anarchist, even with all the um, struggles I've had to deal with. Now, I don't fault someone who says, like Sister Joanna says, I'm not an anarchist. I'm a libertarian socialist or libertarian Marxist, whatever. I'm not faulting those people. Uh, I think we have enough in common we can work together around issues. But, and, and, and I'm not anti, I didn't become anti-white. I understood what the process was that I was dealing with. And there were some white people, well, let me put it this way. I managed to split the anarchist movement and a new anti-authoritarian, a new um, anti-racist trend came about so that the whites started questioning each other. Well, why are you resisting them from even creating their own group? Why are you telling Lorenzo all this stuff that he can't do this and, and he has to say this and he has to, you know what I'm saying? It created conflict on the inside, and so that gave me the wiggle room to be able to organize some, some things and to stay in the anarchist movement. Now, this was my choice as far as staying in the anarchist movement. I could have said, this is impossible, and I'm leaving. And I had no ties to in the extent that somebody could tell me what to do, one way or the other. So my thought was that, look, we have to create this movement. It has to be autonomous. It has to be independent. Uh, it has to be you know, strong enough that it's an entity that can speak back to people who thought they had power or people who had power in the anarchists or socialists and whatever, or to the government for that matter. Uh, people talk about um, talking back to uh, the you know, people, I mean, talking back to the government or to power. Well, we were talking back to the people. <laughs> we were talking back to other people who had misinformed ideas, who had reactionary ideas about the black struggle. Uh, let me just say this. For a long, long time, until the 60s, the old Communist Party and all these other groups, these left formations, believed that black people could only lead a movement uh, for racial consciousness or, or, you know what I'm saying, a black consciousness. We couldn't uh, build a movement that was a revolutionary tendency that could uh, get our own allies, um, who could um, uh, in, encourage other uh, forces in society to join with us uh, in combating the government and fighting fascism and all this. Until the 1960s, this is what people believed. And they saw that it was not true in the, in the 1960s. It was something that nobody, none of these, none of these white academics and radicals and whatever, thought was possible that a black movement 
which was self-directed, uh, would be able to come into existence. They didn't know what the hell to do. I mean, they didn't know what to say. They didn't know how to support it or anything. They couldn't take it over. I mean, uh, one thing you can say about you know, King and these, these uh, they're much more conservative than the later movement, but they wouldn't give up their seat for some white academic or some white radical lecturer or something or other. They weren't giving that up, you know. They wanted their movement to be an autonomous movement. They wanted to have it directed towards the, the plight of black people. And it wasn't something, well, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but we'll, right now we've got to talk about class and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, class is an issue, but the, it, it is even an issue within the black community. But <clears throat> I digress. So I had to create this movement just as they created what they, what, as you described it to me, they created in um, Rojava. And this happens many times. It happens many times in history that peoples of color who have a different history, a different historical experience in relation to the state, we don't, I'm not, somebody said, well, I'm trying to save my lifestyle. Well, I said, well, motherfucker, I'm trying to save my life. <laughs> I'm trying to stop getting killed by the police. I'm trying to stop starving to death because uh, we don't have enough to eat. You know, I'm trying to stop going, ha having to fight going to prison. That's why we're in prison the numbers we're in now. We are not fighting lifestyle changes. We're not trying to uh, just be free to wear whatever ha hair or, or whatever, or who, uh, just to go with who we're like. We're not fighting specifically for that. We're fighting to change the world so we don't have to be confronted with that bullshit. And they won't have any power to force it upon us. That's what we're trying to do. That's what a revolution can do. So, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm uh, united with that experience of having to break away and create uh, another tendency. Now, it doesn't mean separatism. Somebody said, well, you're a separatist. I said, um, I'm, in a, I'm in a movement that's 99% white people, but I'm a separatist. <laughs> so you, you must be out of your mind and, and, and say, no, you must hate white people. Well, I'm in the same room with you. And, you know, and it's just a ridiculous proposition. You know, I was, that's the point I was making. Um, the right of peoples of, of color or, 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 or of other um, political or social persuasion, women, the right should be irrefutable for them to do that, to create a autonomous space, autonomous movement, and to have their voices raised in a way that represents what they think, or what we think, you know what I'm saying? That is a, that should be something that is um, a cardinal principle of any so-called social change movement. So can we, do we want to get this next question right here? And bef be but before you ask that question, I also wanted to say, I didn't mean to, we had a miscommunication there and I know that you wanted to also answer the question about the Wakanda, the Wakanda point that was brought up. So do you want to speak to that as well? And you didn't want to, so did you have anything you want to say? We can say it together. <laughs> we know it's we know it's co-opted in the history of the Black Panther. Wakanda Party. is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so what? if whoever is on Zoom waiting, if you if you want to unmute and ask your question, and then we got one more question here. Okay, so Zoom, we got two more questions and then we'll close out. Okay, I was just wondering, um, what can non-black folks do to support black anarchist movements? And related to that, what are the best experiences you've had with white allies? Thank you for asking that question, I appreciate it. Um, you know, white support, white solidarity, the main thing is to allow 
black people, or you know, black anarchists, black autonomous, whatever we call ourselves, to allow us to do what we need to do to, to deal with our own struggle. That is the biggest thing that, that, you, that you can do to, you know, let us be. Uh, and as Lorenzo always said, I will reemphasize that we are not anti-white, but sometimes you can support people by just letting them do what they need to do the way that they need to do it. And that is really, in my opinion, the, the biggest thing that the white activists, white anti-racists can do. And of course, another thing is the fact that uh, the, the reason we are still having these kind of discussions, even about issues of white supremacy, patriarchy within the anarchist movement, is, is that over the generations, uh, um, you know, uh, anarchists of European descent who are elders like me and Lorenzo, by and large, have not done the job over the last half century of, of tackling this issue. You cannot have, as somebody said yesterday, you cannot have a discussion on white supremacy at your conference in 2000 and decide you're not gonna have a discussion again until 2010. You have to talk about this stuff all of the time, all of the time, because it's always present. So my, ch my challenge, my request, my plea to white anti-racists, whether you're an anarchist or not, you may not be, is, is that to begin to do the work in, uh, among white people, okay? Uh, you know, I, 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 we can't, I mean, I can't, I can't speak for anybody else. I can't, it's all I can do at this point in my life to deal with the struggles in the black community. But who is going to do the work uh, among white people? I know all white people aren't the same and all white people are not hardcore racist, but we all know there's something going on. There's a growing fascism among many white people in this country. Who is going to do the work there? Who is going to speak to that? That is a kind of support that, that in solidarity that you know, I at least as a, as a black woman uh, in, in the struggle, that is what I need, that type of support. Please, somebody's got to do it. Well, one thing for sure, uh, the situation where, let's say for there are two elements or two individuals in the, in the um, uh, black anarchist movement, and, and I'm, I'm saying this more than just in, in an academic sense. White people on the outside, white activists, have got to stop interfering and picking sides, picking sides, picking one person, because that person sounds like they, who they want to respond, who they want to uh, support, um, and then the other person is demonized or try to neutralize them, silence them, whatever. Now, that stuff happened to me. I'm not going into a lot of detail about it and so forth. I'm just going to say that it's just important that in a movement that professes everyone has the right to self-theory and self-liberation and so forth and so on, in a movement like that, then black people don't have the right to do this. Every other people have come to America or exist around the world can create a tendency but somehow, if we do it, it's a threat, you know, somehow. Um, so it's important, as the sister says, I'm with her. You know, she's not with me. I'm with her. I want to get that straight now. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, as she said, you know, let the movement develop on its own terms. Don't let fear or hatred or, or whatever get in the way of, of allowing a movement to develop. And that's what's kept us from this point. I mean, you know, from being able to build a broad-based black anarchist tendency is because of interference, of playing off one, one person or one group against another and all this other stuff, sending people into movements and, and creating disruption. And, and, you know, let the people in those movements develop let them resolve their differences. Let them do whatever they need to do. And then um, I think it would strengthen the entire anarchist movement. Now, that's, my, that's been my belief all along. And um, some people believe it, believed it. Many people didn't. 
And uh, I was always an outcast and all this other stuff within, within the anarchist movement to a large degree. I, I want you to know that. We can avoid that. We can avoid that just by stepping back, respecting people's space, respecting people's positions, and um, letting it all happen. All right. Um, Let me just say something quickly about that. Great. Um, uh, it's been my experience that once you sit down and talk and come to a conclusion about what you want to do, everybody's judged by the capacity, their, their, their willingness to carry out what they say they're going to do. So just show up, be there, and do what you what the groups decide want want to do. Like for instance, uh, in our situation in, in Stone Mountain, Georgia, uh, and uh, William knows about it. But but there's been a controversy where we got a little bookstore there in Stone Mountain, Georgia. There's there's uh, the Ku Klux Klan has been essentially moved out of town, but there's some residuals of them still around. And so the the the, the flag. As you enter the city, is on a on a flagpole, but the city owns the flagpole, and the Confederate flag used to be up there. Somebody pulled the Confederate flag down, so the issue now is: should they remove the whole the whole uh, flagpole? So you know, we we talk about it, and then when when it's time to show up to the city council, uh, you know, we're glad to see white people uh, vociferously. Uh, support put our effort, and they're they're very good at it. And that's how you build alliances. You build build alliances and trust through people doing what they're supposed to do and doing what they agreed to do, and discuss it, you know, about how effective it was, and just be equal among equals. That's all. But do what you're supposed to do, and don't claim no privilege. Don't claim no privilege at all. Just do it. <laughs> do what you're supposed to do. It'll, it'll turn out all right. <laughs> it really will. Okay. So I think we got two two questions left. We have one, y'all two, and then can we? I think mine is more appropriate for black and African. Okay. So do you did you have a question? So can we get these last two questions and then we we'll close out? Is that all right? Perfect. If y'all want to just ask back to back and then y'all can just free for all again. Oh, so mine mostly has to do with the nonprofit thing again, because that's something I've been grappling with. Um, for our purposes in building community power and autonomy, in your personal opinion, are nonprofits safe to engage with at all, since we know they're no. an arm? No. No. Okay, thank you. No. <laughs> okay. So not at all, not even like trying to infiltrate or just no. No. So we got that. For, we we want we want we're just gonna do both, and then y'all can answer all of it together. Okay. Hello. <laughs> all power to the people. Um, uh, I have uh, a question about uh, alliances, uh, so-called ethnic lines, uh, gender, uh, but basically ethnic, uh, and I wanted um, someone to talk about Slim Coleman in Chicago, Chicago um, uh, and the International Intercommunal Survival Committee. Thank you. Okay. Y'all want to just go for all those questions? Nonprofits and Chicago? Well, you want to talk about the nonprofits first, and I'll talk about Intercommunal Survival Committee. Well, I, I don't know anything about it. William, I don't know anything about it. I heard you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. I, you got each other. I, I, I was talking about nonprofits being, you know, nonprofits are not an innocent thing. It's, it's been in American law a long time. But um, in 1986, as I pointed out with the, the 1986 tax code, and the ability, as Jonina was saying, to give for foundations, uh, corporate foundations, to give money to so called radical organizations. Um, it was, in fact, a counterinsurgency method. And I'm not trying to hype it up like some James Bond kind of thing. Uh, it just was part of the COINTELPRO program. It was part of the government uh, uh, neutralizing program. 
And um, its purpose was to, as I pointed out, make sure that radical groups or what would be radical groups are not ch challenging the uh, state itself, but that they were willing to uh, work with the existing power structure. And they would work, in fact, to destroy um, autonomous movements and radical movements from that period. And they did that, pretty much. I mean, they ain't killed us all off, but they killed a lot of groups off and, and, and broke them down because they didn't have resources to combat these people and to combat these groups. And so these phony groups take the place of what was uh, the real groups, okay? Um, now, in this period, these uh, things have taken over. These uh, nonprofit entities controlled by the corporations have taken over, have taken power from uh, radical movements. We ain't all dead, but we are in the margins now. We're way, way in the margins, you know. And so we're trying to find new ways of organizing. And for me, anarchism was that new way because it wasn't, as far as I know, uh, taking money from uh, the rich. It was trying to take money from the rich. And I said, oh, yes, expropriation. I'm right with you. And I believe that's what, and let me just mention this as black people, people here. Uh, I believe that that is what we should do with the reparations movement. We should make it a, a protest movement, a fight back movement, and uh, expropriate the rich with it. Put threats on the city government. I'm not saying go in and put a cap in them or something. It ain't that stage, but I'm just saying that we need to organize a, a protest movement that can put pressure on them. That's what a lot of people think expropriation means banditry. I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm not against it, but I'm not saying it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, yeah. And, um, but I, I just think that, yeah, we, that's what we need. We need to rethink some things. Um, the, the Wayne was asking about the uh, Intercommunal Survival Committee, and during the 1960s, you know, you had my, you know, we talked about black people migrating from the South. Well, you also had uh, poor, low-income white people from Appalachia were migrating from where they lived. Okay, and uh, many of them migrated to the Chicago metropolitan area in the 1960s, 1970s, and. Um, they started organizing because they realized, you know, they, they ran into the Black Panther Party. And it was a, the group I'm talking about is the Intercommunal uh, Survival Committee, which took part of their name from, you know, the Black Panther Party's uh, paper on, you know, intercommunalism. But they were made up of, of, of poor white working class people who had migrated from Appalachia to Chicago, but they wanted to deal with the issues in their community uh, along addressing them along the lines that the Black Panther Party was organizing, you know, in, in the black community. And, you know, this to me has been one of the best examples that I have seen, you know, at least in my lifetime, of, you know, uh, white people organizing against, you know, poverty and how uh, white supremacy affected them uh, as white people in this country. So um, I think if you... I hope that you can still find something online if you go on and Google it, Intercommunal Survival Committee. Uh, they were based in Chicago, Illinois, at least for, for, the, for the most part. But that's a very important part of the struggle because unless we have those, that kind of organizing going on among you know, poor, low-income low uh, white people in America, we, we can't get to the final goal, which is a total overthrow of capitalism. We've got to have this going on, you know, on a broad, broad scale. And so uh, one of the people that did this uh, was, one of the people that was their leaders was Slim Coleman. I think Slim is a pastor now, so if you Google Reverend Slim Coleman, you may find information about it. But it's, it's worth studying, obviously, period we're living in right now is 19, not 1960s Chicago, but to look at what they were trying to do and how they were trying to do it in, you know, poor white uh, Appalachian communities. Well, 
Well, um, this has been a phenomenal discussion and I have learned a lot and I talk to y'all all the time and I'm always learning every time I talk with y'all. And I really am appreciative of um, you all taking the time and everybody uh, who's been participating in, in this dialogue. Uh, it's just been absolutely um, historic and monumental. And I want to thank you all for your work, for all. Can we just give some acknowledgement to? I just, I just want to say as we close out that, you know, these, these are three people here who speak so much about folks who are over, other people who are overlooked and um, who are rank and file and don't get the credit that they deserve within uh, the, the history of um, black struggle in this country, but they oftentimes speak about it in a way that I don't feel like y'all even give yourselves the credit that's due for how you've been overlooked and how your history has been neglected and for all of the things that you've contributed. So um, I think just really, I want to say that on behalf of so many people that want to say it to y'all that we're very appreciative. So um, we have another uh, session in the morning with Ashanti Alston, who is going to be speaking uh, with, with me about the uh, futures of black anarchism at 915. And I hope that there is a fly around me. I'm sorry, that's why I'm doing that. But <laughs> if, if everybody um, would please join us again tomorrow, we're, I think we're gonna have another phenomenal discussion about taking a lot of the, the aspects we talked about today forward in terms of uh, organizing and um, the thinking and the writing and all of the things that are gonna play a different part in, in this sort of work. So, and we'll, we'll let Sister Janana close us out. Um, well, and Lorenzo and I would like to uh, thank, um, thank William uh, for his support. He's been working with us for a while on the Black Podcast, Black Autonomy Podcast. We first met him when he was a student at the University of Memphis, I guess 12, 13 years ago. I was an organizer. For the conference. It, okay, but the meeting was at the University of Memphis, right? And that's where we first met him, but we hadn't had sort of lost track over the years. But we want to, we're so glad that we came back into contact with William and he has kind of pushed us back out there in, in some ways. Uh, uh, you know, uh, still for, for myself, I'm still a work in progress in terms of what it means to be an elder, what it means to be a revolutionary elder, still trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do and what my role is supposed to do. And you know, I probably will never have the answer. But I just wanted to end quickly with this one thing. In uh, about 10 years ago, um, Comrade Wayne, who was, I was in the Black Panther Party with here in Detroit, he and I had a discussion. And he said, John Nina, he said, you know, sometimes I wonder if I'm still relevant. And I thought, wow, you know, that's deep, you know. Um, and Wayne and I are the same age. We're both 75 years old. So um, he said, I wonder if I'm still relevant. It made me think. I said, hmm, yeah, I guess I wonder if I'm still relevant too. And this is about 10 years ago. And so, um, uh, and it's a question I turn over in my mind a lot, all the time. Am I still relevant? Is there still a place for me? Is there still room for my voice? Can I be of any help? And so I mentioned this conversation to Lorenzo, and uh, he gave his quick to the point answer. He said, Jonina, you're relevant to they close your coffin, to they close the, they close the, 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 the yeah, till they close your coffin. So uh, mine hasn't been closed yet. And I want to thank William especially for helping to make us realize that we can and are still relevant. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Hope to see y'all at 915 at Anarchist, Black Anarchist Futures. Thank you, Modibo. Thank you, Modibo. I don't think yeah, Modibo's even paying attention anymore. <laughs> he's tuned out, he's zoned out. <laughs>